God, amen. Tonight I was asked to share something about His Holiness. I'm sure most of you were there on Sunday at the funeral prayer or in the liturgy when Abu Shoi talked about Him. His Holiness isn't the easiest person to talk about because you can't do it in half an hour. If you talk about his monastic life, you could talk about it for hours on end. If you talk about even just his asceticism as a pope, you know, I have a... Sherry's family is related to the pope, so somebody, one of her family members was able to go into uh, his room in the monastery. And something people don't know is that I don't know if this is in his older age, but while he was patriarch, his holiness used to sleep on a bench. He used to sleep on a pew. And you could only imagine, even in the last, I mean, this was within the last, like, 10 years. So he was like 78 years old. You could only imagine a 78-year-old man with all the stress and all the need for sleep and all the health issues. He would sleep on a bench Every day. He used to eat very, very, very little. And even though he was supposed to take medicines and he had to be eating, he had to be eating with his medicines, he wouldn't eat from Holy Thursday till Easter. He would fast from Holy Thursday till Easter. Again, as an 80-year-old man who, who, who was taking medicines and is, is constantly getting treatment. I can't imagine, I was telling somebody this earlier, I can't imagine the world without His Holiness. It was as almost though He was kind of like a guardian angel for the Coptic Church. And not just the Coptic Church, but Christians all over the world. Re uh, this last Sunday, one of the Syrian Orthodox priests came to, to offer condolences to us. And he was saying, you know, Abuna, all of us, all the leadership of our church, we don't have very many good writings uh, available in Arabic. So what we do is all of us read the writings of His Holiness. And that is more than enough to be like uh, the perfect curriculum for spiritual maturity and spiritual growth. So His Holiness is, is, is amazing. He's also somebody that made theology very difficult theological things and made them easy for young children to understand. So He, in His great intellectual capacity could turn huge things into things that young children would understand. He could interpret uh, lots of uh, theological stories or, or, or terms into very simple practices. Tonight, I don't want to talk about His Holiness because I won't stop. But I do want us to read a passage from a book that has been life-changing for myself. And if you've read this chapter, if you read it, every day of your life, it still would not be enough for you as a servant. This is the most dynamic thing that I feel like His Holiness wrote about one of his own personal experiences. I'm going to go ahead and read it, and I'm willing to share the microphone if you're willing to be a very good, clear reader. If you're not willing to be a very good, clear, fast reader, then if it's okay, I'd like to just go through so that we can make sure that... It, it goes, but I want you to pay attention. It's about 12 pages, of, of a, they're short pages, but I want you to listen to the details and the emotions in it. And this is what drove His Holiness's drive in His service from before He was patriarch till three days ago, four days ago. These words, this is what drove Him from day and night as a servant of God. So we're going to start just so we can, can save some time. It happened on that night that I was alone in my private room, stretched on my seat and looking at nothing when a sinful smile passed on my lips. Perhaps I was thinking of myself as a minister, but something strange happened. I do not know whether my head became heavy and I fell asleep or my thoughts strayed and turned into dreams or God showed me a revelation. The only thing I know is that I looked and saw before me a group of angels of light who carried me on their wings and I went up. 
I looked down on the earth below me and found it diminishing little by little until it looked like a tiny, luminous spot in space. I listened also to the noise of the world and heard it decrease and then turn into silence. I felt my body becoming lighter and lighter until I felt as if I were a spirit without a body. I looked around me in bewilderment and saw many spirits swimming like me in the limitless space. I saw also thousands and tens of thousands of angels, the cherubim with six wings and the seraphim full of eyes. The voices of all rose in wonderful harmony saying, holy, holy, holy. I found myself unconsciously chanting with them, holy is God the Father, holy is the only begotten Son, holy is the Holy Spirit. I woke up from my chanting on hearing a holy faint tune which no ear has ever heard before. I went towards the source of the sound very eager to see what was there. I found before me at a distance a beautiful luminous city hanging in the heavens and echoing hymns and songs. Every tune filled my heart with joy and my soul with longing. Inside the city far off there were shadows that looked more beautiful than the angels. There was Moses, Elijah, and all the prophets. There were St. Anthony, St. Athanasius, and all the saints. I saw also my fathers, the bishops and priests, and my confession father. There were also some of my colleagues, the teachers of the Sunday schools. I could not wait to see. I rushed towards that luminous city. But, to my amazement, I could not proceed because there was a valiant, awful, venerable, and dignified angel who stood in my way saying, Stop where you are. Where are you going? I answered, I'm going to this great city, my master, the angel, where I see my colleagues, my brethren, and my fathers, the saints. But the angel looked at me in astonishment and said, but this is the city of the ministers. Are you one of them? When I replied positively, he said, you are wrong, my friend. Your name is not in the list of the ministers. I was overwhelmed by astonishment and cried in the face of that angel who was in guard of the city saying, how is that? Perhaps you do not know me, my master, the angel. Ask about me in the Sunday schools, in the meetings of the youth, in the churches and the assemblies. Ask about me even in the city of the ministers itself, for many of my colleagues, the teachers of Sunday schools, know me well. He answered me, I know you well, and they also know you, yet you are not in God's judgment a minister. I could not bear these words, and I fell on my knee weeping bitterly. When another angel came and wiped away every tear from my eyes and said to me gently, my brother... You are in the place from where sorrow and sighing have fled away. Why are you sorry then? Come and let us reason together. And we sat alone, reasoning together. He said, Those whom you see in the city of the ministers devoted all their lives to God. They spent every moment of their time in the ministry. Do you not agree with me that the lives of St. Paul and other apostles, the lives of the bishops, priests, and deacons, and the lives of the saints? As for you, my friend... You were not devoted to the ministry, but you served the world. All your spiritual ministry was just one hour every week in the Sunday schools. And sometimes your service in other fields made you give God another hour. For those two hours then, you want to be with the apostles, the prophets, and the priests in the city of the ministers? During all this talk, I was bowing my head in shame, but I tried to overcome my bashfulness and dared to ask the angel. But I see in the city some of my colleagues, the teachers of the Sunday schools, who did the same service like me. Here the angel replied, no, they are not like you. Though they served one hour or more in the Sunday schools, they spent the whole week getting ready for that hour. They spent much time preparing the lessons, the illustrative media, and the means which would make the persons ministered to desire to hear the lesson, and above all, praying for all this. They also gave much care to examine the state of each pupil separately and to think of a way to reform him. Add to this their involvement in visiting those persons and inventing useful means to fill the time of those pupils during the week. Besides, they had other concealed services which you do not know. They considered the spiritual ministry their main work and other worldly affairs as secondary. This does not mean that they neglected their responsibilities and worldly duties. No, for they were very faithful and, su and successful in performing them. Such worldly affairs even comprised some service. Thus God counted them consecrated. I wondered at these words and asked him, 
How can I be a minister though I am busy with my worldly work? The angel replied, Perhaps, my brother, you have forgotten the generality of the ministry. You ought to serve God at any time and in any place, whether in the church, in the street, amidst your family, in the place of your work, or wherever you go or exist. There must be no separation between one's job and one's ministry. In the city of the ministers, we have teachers who were able to attract their Christian pupils to the Sunday schools and could reform them and gave them continuous care. We have also in the city physicians who did not practice medicine merely for profit, but were concerned first of all about the health of their patients, whatever their financial condition was. They sometimes treated the patient and sent him the medicine free. They even established hospitals, hospitals and dispensaries which offered medical care free of charge. We have also employees who encourage their colleagues to go to church, to confess, partake of the holy sacraments. There are also engineers, lawyers, artists, merchants, and manufacturers who served God while practicing their works. Were you like them? I was ashamed of myself and gave no reply. But the angel continued, blaming me severely. That was concerning your ministry within the scope of your job. What about serving your own family? Joshua, whom you see in the city, said, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What about you? You did not serve your family, but rather disputed continually with them. You failed to be a model for them to follow. What did you do for your friends, your neighbors, and acquaintances? You used to visit them on the Nativity and Easter days, but never talked to them about these occasions, about the new regeneration and the rising from sin. On the other hand, you took part in their worldly joys and wasted many opportunities given to you to serve them. Do you consider yourself, in spite of all this, a minister? I bowed my head in shame for the third time, but I tried to give a reply, saying, But my master, the angel, you know I am of poor talents, and it was impossible for me to perform all this service. The angel was astonished at my words and seemed as if hearing such a view for the first time. He addressed me sharply. Talents? Who said that without talents you cannot serve? My brother, there is what is called silent preaching. You were not required to deliver a sermon, but to be an example. When people look at your face, they learn meekness, cheerfulness, and simplicity. When they hear you talking, they learn chastity, truth, and honesty. When they deal with you, they find leniency, faithfulness, sacrifice, and love of others. Thus, they love you imitate you and become godly, though you did not preach them or deliver a sermon. You could have prayed for them and your prayers would have benefited them more than your preaching. For the fourth time, I felt ashamed and confused and could not reply. And again the angel continued, by silent preaching, you ought to have avoided offenses. You ought to have refrained from any behavior, though it be innocent outwardly, if people were to misunderstand it and be offended by it. Thus you would have been blameless before God and people as the Holy Bible tells us, putting before you the words of St. Paul the Apostle. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. I contemplated on my life and found that in many cases I made others, though unintentionally, sin. Here the angel cut my reflection, saying leniently, This is not all. I want to tell you besides that I pitied you much, my dear human friend. I pitied you more when you were in the world, and particularly at the times you suffered from self-righteousness. As you looked at your numerous services, you thought of yourself an example of ministry, while you were not counted as a minister at all. You may remember many other faults you made. For example, yours was a formal service. You used to go to the Sunday schools as a weekly habit, and to lead the prayers, take down the names of the present and the absent, and give prizes to the pupils who attended regularly and neglect the absent as if he was not in your charge. Your service was void of the spirit and love, and so could not touch the hearts of the children. Your words and acts were not coming from your heart. Your chanting lacked the spirit of joy. Your prayers were not humble, meditative, or imploring, and your orders lacked the spirit of love. Thus your service was not effective. Even when you preached in the church, you did so because the priest asked you, and you promised and had to fulfill your promise. Your main concern was to divide the subject into sections and put them in order 
in such a form that might attract the admiration more than gain the salvation of the souls. Your voice, though being loud, harmonious, and clear, was cold and had no life in it. You felt happy when anyone praised you. You even, though you did not show this, but you were not concerned about whether your words gave such a person new life or not. Do you not see, my friend, that you served yourself rather than God and people? Do you not remember that you welcomed the service in famous great churches, crowded with people rather than the service in small unknown churches? This is yet another evidence against you. Moreover, your ministry lacked two things, the love for the ministry and the love of those whom you minister to. As for the love of the ministry, it is evident in the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Were you hungry and thirsty for the salvation of the souls? Were you dreaming all the week of the hour which you were to spend with your children at the Sunday school? Did you feel pain for anyone who did not come and long to see him not coming down until you met him and explained to him the lesson which he missed? As for the second matter, which is the love of those ministered to, did you really love them and love them to the end as the Lord Jesus Christ did for his disciples? Did you feel compassion upon and give them abounding kindness? And the pupils themselves, did they love you likewise or were you all the time rebuking and punishing them by not giving them prizes and pictures. Who told you that this way was fit for reforming them? I'm going to repeat that again. Who told you that this way was fit for reforming them? Love, my dear man, is the main basis for ministry. Unless you love those whom you minister to, you will not be able to serve them. And unless they love you, they will not benefit from you. Here, my real self being revealed to me, I was ashamed. But the angel looked at me very sympathetically and lovingly and said, I want to tell you an important fact, which is that you ought to have spent a long time getting ready and filled up before starting the ministry. But because you started early without having spirit, sufficient spiritual experience, you fell in many faults. I looked at him inquiringly as if finding it hard for me to make any faults while I was responsible for correcting the faults of others. The angel observing my look said, there was a boy whom you dismissed from the Sunday schools for his disobedience and for not following the discipline. This made him more obstinate and led him to the street and to wicked company. Thus he became worse and many serious harms befell him due to your behavior. Especially after he had lost guidance and care, Certainly you were responsible for that because it was your responsibility. I answered the angel, but sir, he used to interrupt the lesson and it was a bad example for the others. Here the angel replied bitterly, then you dismissed him for that reason? Oh, you are poor. Did the Lord Jesus Christ send you to call the righteous or the sinners to repentance? Your blessed students who were the cause of your feeling self-righteous had their blessedness from God. He worked within them. But this naughty boy ought to have been taken care of by you. For such a type you were called by God. I tell you plainly, had you devoted all your efforts to reform that boy alone without doing any other service, that would have been sufficient to let you enter the city of the ministers. You ought to have recognized the value of that soul and ought to have had much long suffering. A servant of the Sunday schools who lacks these two qualities does not deserve to be a servant. I said to the angel imploring, what do you think I ought to have done for that boy? He answered, you ought to have served him as far as you could, to have examined his interior and dealt with him according to his state. You ought to have prayed much for him. And if you had done all this, but it was useless, you ought not to have dismissed him, but sent him to another class. Perhaps another servant would have succeeded to achieve what you have failed to do. If this solution had not been, any, been of any benefit, you could have allocated one or more classes for such naughty children where they could have had a special care according to their condition. Such children ought to have been visited frequently and given sincere care, making them near to your hearts and not dismissing them in any case. They were not more wicked than Zacchaeus, the Samaritan woman, or the people of Nineveh in their bad state who ministers to God, never knows despair as long as he has 
humility in prayers, and a loving heart. I regretted my past actions, but the angel continued. There was another boy in your class who was absent for a week or two, and you did not visit him. You behaved like an official employee at the Sunday schools and just wrote his name down as an absentee. The boy, seeing that you did not visit him, came no longer, and you, seizing the opportunity, wrote off his name from your list. At this point, the angel looked firmly at me and said, Why did you not visit him? I felt weak before him due to his sharp voice and firm look, so I kept silent in fear. But he repeated the questions more harshly this time. Why did you not visit him? I felt as if a storm was crushing my head and did not reply while the angel trembled and said in agitation, his spiritual condition now arouses pity. And if he continues so, he will. Here the angel's voice quivered. He stopped a little then said, I and many other angels pray for him that God may save him. However, if God responds to our prayers and sends him another minister who may be honest and the boy is saved, you will not be excused. His voice was faint and distressed. I could not bear hearing it. So I felt everything revolving before my eyes and I fainted and fell down. When I came to myself, I found the angel looking at me compassionately. This encouraged me to speak. I said, please forgive me, sir. There were 30 boys in my class, and I was not able to visit them all. But he replied me, you also were tempted with the same temptation, that of the number of those whom you minister to. God does not measure any service with the measure of the numbers, but rather by the number of those who are actually renewed and saved. I know it was difficult for you to take care of 30 boys with respect to discipline, visits, care, and teaching. It was even difficult for you to learn their names by heart. You could not say, as the Lord Jesus Christ said, I know my sheep and am known by my own. Why then did you not confine your service to ten? Only, for example. Finding no answer for his question, I preferred to keep silent. But he continued. Do you know the main reason for your failure besides what we have mentioned? It is self-reliance. You forgot to fast and pray for the ministry. Your colleagues in the Sunday school who are now in the city of the servants used to pray and to fast for their classes. Every day they mentioned their children before God, asking him for each of them separately. They used to ask the fathers, the priests, to raise prayers in a special liturgy for them. Did you do that? That was concerning your spiritual ministry. What about your material service? Did you consider it a secondary matter? Did you not remember how the rich man perished? because he did not have compassion upon poor Lazarus? Did you not hear the words of the Lord Jesus Christ addressed to those on the left hand? I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, naked, sick. What did you do of all this? Did you not insist to have certain luxuries while your brethren were in bad need for necessities? Did you not? I could not bear more and cried out in pain, Please, sir, stop. I realize now that I was not deserving at all to enter the city of the servants. I was self-conceited to a far extent. But now, having known everything, I ask for another chance to behave as a real honest servant. The angel said to me, you had your chance, but you did not make good use of it. Now your days on earth have ended. I entreated him and wept and begged, but he looked at me compassionately and lovingly. Then left me alone and went away while I was still crying out. I want another chance. I want another chance. But he disappeared and I fell on my knees still crying. I want another chance. Everything turning around me and I fainted again. As long time had passed before I came to myself, I opened my eyes to find myself to my great astonishment alone in my private room, stretched on my seat. I looked around not believing. I looked again, but it was true. Oh, how merciful you are, God. Is it true I have another chance to be a good servant? I got up and raised my heart with a deep thanksgiving prayer. I decided to tell my brethren, the servants, everything to strive in order to deserve to enter to the city of the servants. Thus, I took some papers and began to write. It happened that night. Do 
These are the words that drove his holiness from the second, I should say, before he woke up to after he fell asleep. That you would think all of us, anybody who saw the sermon of his holiness two weeks ago, all of us were thinking, Sayyidina, you're justified to take a nap, to say, sorry, I can't give a talk today. I'm on my deathbed. Hopefully it's understandable for everybody. And everybody would have said, of course, Sayyidina, relax and enjoy. And everybody would have been willing to go give him like a massage or do something. Like you would imagine that it's so justifiable to say, relax. Why come out and give a sermon so that he could say before the last, before the throne of God, until my last breath. Until my last breath. If anybody wants to comment on anything we just read, each person needs to ask themselves, where do I stand in this? I was hearing a, a sermon by somebody that spoke recently, in this last week, about His Holiness Pope Shenouda. And he said the bishops were saying, Sayyidina al-Baba ma'adna. Like, basically, he gave us a complex. Why? Because the guy is... 80 years old, he doesn't sleep. And here we are, 30, 40, 50 year old bishops, and we can't do half of what he does. We can't. And so the bishops are saying, we can never just take a break because our perfect example in His Holiness never takes a break. He never takes a break. What did these words mean to you? What did these words mean to you? Especially when he talked about. The kid that was disrupting the class. And what did he do? He dismissed the class, the, the kid. Servants, I'm sure it's happened at one point before in which there was a difficult child or a difficult person that you were serving that maybe you asked them to leave the, serve, to, to leave the room or you disciplined them in some way. Did you understand the great negative impact that child would have, or that, that, that those words would have on that child. You could imagine a kid in fourth grade, fifth grade, asking to, be leave, to, to leave a class from a Sunday school servant. I want to ask you guys, how do you think a fourth grader, a fifth grader would interpret getting kicked out of a church Sunday school class? You're a child. What's going on in your head? as a fourth grader or fifth grader, as getting kicked out. Anyone want to share? Throw some, take a stab at it. God is mad at you. God doesn't love me. I hate Sunday school. What kind of church is this? I'm a bad person. I don't want to come again. I don't know how many people that, like, I've run into and I ask them, you know, why don't you come to church? Or, you know, they haven't been to church since they moved to even the Washington area. They said, because a long time ago I was a deacon and I served in the altar. And the priest yelled at me in front of everyone because I, you know, dropped the shoria or I didn't bring it in the right time. And from that point I never stepped into church again. I had an experience of... I visited somebody that hadn't been to church for like 17 years. This was before I was ordained. Finally, he agreed to come to church to help do like set up in a church. And we set up some chairs. He set up like 200 chairs. And him not being a churched person was like these chairs were in a church. So he was kind of laying down in the church and he had his feet up on one of the chairs. The guy was like, he broke his back serving in the church. And a priest walked in. And masah bil art. He wiped the floor with this boy. And he said, Do you think you're here in some nadi? Why are you sitting like this? You think you're here in like some kind of like club or whatever or some gym? Get out of here. Why are you sitting like this? Hadn't been to church for 17 years. I don't know if he's going to come to church for another 17 years. I'm not worried for the boy as much as I'm worried for the priests. Because we are asked 
it's nice to have the prestige of, oh, I serve a hundred kids in high school. And the priest of a church with 10,000 families or whatever it is, it's prestigious. It's not prestigious. There are places above that that's not prestigious. What's prestigious is the person that lays down their life for the sheep. And again, the reason why I read this to you is because these are not from the Bible. This is a man that had the same flesh and the same nature just like you and I who witnessed this, who heard this story, and the rest of his life was driven to become filled with every... How is it that the Pope's words, people can quote him and people remember everything that he says and the impact that his sermons had all over the world and that could be put into books? It was the, the mystery of or the secret of his weekly monastery visit. Two or three days a week. Two or three days a week. The Pope, if anybody ever tells me they're busy, yeah, I mean, be ship ship. Like, <laughs> like, you're gonna, like you deserve to get beat. Of course, not by me, because I wouldn't want to cast you out of the church, and I wouldn't want to be judged for it. If anybody tells me that they're busy, go tell someone else. Neither is it going to be accepted here, Neither is it going to be accepted in the kingdom of God. So the I was busy. You know, a few years ago, we had a, a contract in the church. We wanted to, the, servants to, the servants to maintain a certain standard. We got rid of the contract. Ya salam al ayat that we heard from the contract. Why do we have to sign the contract? And why do I have to do this? And why? You don't want to live. Okay, if you're not going to do any of these things, empty. No brainer. If it's not going to cost me anything, when somebody comes to your door and sells you something, and you say, how much is it going to cost me? And they say nothing. Okay, you sign. It's not going to cost you anything because that's your life. I'm not talking about a contract. I'm talking about standards that we need to live by. And we have, again, the perfect icon. The perfect icon in His Holiness. I pray that these words would convict us and that we would, everybody would go find the book. It's called Release of the Spirit. I think it's chapter 20. It happened that night is the name of the chapter. Read it every so often. Not because you read it today and you heard it. No. Because these are standards that he was held to as, this was not a pope. He was a Sunday school servant and he was held to these standards. So I really pray that we would, we also would hold ourselves to high standards. And glory be to God for every man. Now I just want to share a couple stories of Sayyidina al-Baba, just so you can, know, like some of the miracles that, that happened under His Holiness. There was a time when he was in exile. He was in the monastery. In, uh, in the early 80s, he was in the monastery. He was asked to stay in the monastery. In, he was imprisoned in the monastery. And the Pope had asked the, the bishop and the monks to build a wall around the monastery. So they took the, the order and they went to go find out, okay, how many trucks do we need and how much cement? And they started. And then the, the security or the FBI people basically said, no trucks are coming in and no trucks are going out. Okay. No one is allowed to enter into the monastery. You're not getting any trucks. You're not getting any cement. So they came back to the Pope. And they said, Sayyidina, we can't build the wall. He said, Yani. He said, no. They said, no trucks in and no trucks out. He says, what do you want? They said, Sayyidina, we need like 20 trucks of cement. What else? They said, you know, we need this brand. Okay, he took his staff. And he wrote the order in the air. And signed it, Shinuda. 20 minutes later, truck after truck after truck after truck, one by one started coming in, and all the monks were like, what happened? Somehow they let him in, they got the wall, they were able to build the wall around the monastery. This is just, it's just an example of the power of this man's prayers. The power of this man's prayers. Another story that maybe you heard it, or maybe you, you don't know if you heard it from me or you heard it from others. There was a young lady 
on, his way, on her way to the, the Wednesday meeting. And she got into a taxi cab. And, she, you know, he said, where are you going? She said, you know, the cathedral in Abba Sayyid. So she got in. He's going. And he takes a different route. And she says, where are you going? And he says, Malish, um, the roads are cut off or whatever, so I had to take a different route. So he, she ends up going. She gets kidnapped by this taxi driver, taken into an apartment with five men, all of them, you know, uh, extremists. And they said, you have to choose which one of us is going to be your husband. And all of us, you know, they were all going to rape her. And she screamed. She said, Ilha'ni ya Sayyidna. I was going to your meeting. In one second, Pope Shenouda showed up in the room, grabbed her hand, and said, Ta'ali ma'ya binti. And he looked at the guys in the face. And as she left the apartment, she found herself walking into the steps of the cathedral. She sent up a question saying, thank you, Sayyidna, for saving me. And Sayyidna basically said, like, yani, it wasn't me. Hamda'a salam ta'ki binti. Yani, welcome to the, to the church. He is, he was, he was an angel. He really was an angel. He was, he was very in tune of, uh, of other things. He could, recently in one of our visits to Cleveland, there was, we were sitting with His Holiness and this random priest walked in to greet His Holiness. And like nobody really knew him. He was kind of just coming to, he came and he kissed Satan's hand. And Abuna said, Abuna. All of us are sitting there. Raga nafsak. Examine yourself and see if what you're doing is right. The guy like kissed the Pope's hand and just walked out of the room. Like that was it. He drove six hours or however many hours, he came, kissed the Pope's hand, and psh, walked out. The Pope was able to know exactly what this person was coming for, and he was a very, very, very blessed man. We are so blessed to be living under the reign of His Holiness. I imagine when he entered the kingdom of God, who were the people that greeted him? I wonder if St. Anthony said, your, your, your star is going to be shining just as bright as mine because of what you did in the monastic life in the Coptic church. And if St. Mark came and said, you were a faithful patriarch. And if St. Paul says, you're preaching one, maybe even, potentially even more than St. Paul, St. Paul didn't serve the millions that His Holiness served. But it is possible that these saints came out and said, well done, good and faithful servant. I cannot imagine what this world will be like without Him. When we were in Egypt, we were supposed to meet His Holiness when we had a, a mission trip to Egypt uh, two years ago, a year and a half ago. We were supposed to meet His Holiness in the monastery in Amba Bishoy. And that same week, Chaos broke out in Egypt, and basically there was threats on the cathedral and, and the Pope and all these things. And so the Pope, usually he was going to meet us in the monastery, but he said, sorry, I can't come to the monastery because, he says, if I leave the monastery, anything can happen. But if I stay in Cairo, nothing will happen. And the Pope was like a lion for the people. If he was there, no one would dare mess with the cathedral or mess with Sayyidina, or the angels that are surrounding him at all times. He was always extremely lighthearted. He was, even though he was an ascetic, he was very playful and he was a joker. He used to always joke and he always tell Sayyidi jokes and he was very funny. Sometimes we have this impression that to be spiritual is to have a makashur face, like a sad face, and yell at, and when I was in the monastery, I don't know how many monks yelled at me. I was going to kill them all. I was going crazy. Everybody thinks that it's spiritual to just tear into anybody they see. That wasn't the example of His Holiness. The most ascetic, but the most loving. There was a balance between His discipline and His love. And the way that He would deal. Many people would judge Sayyidina by maybe the people that he was close to or the people that he surrounded with. And people would say, like, how could Sayyidina be friends with these people? But Sayyidina didn't judge them, but he was Christ to them. He was Christ to them. If everybody else thought that this person was a bad person or shouldn't be around or close to the Pope or whatever it may be, 
No, he was a father and he was like Christ in every situation. Again, the stories can, can go on about his holiness. I pray that we would get into his books. And I know maybe the translations of his books aren't the greatest translations. Get over it. Suck it up. Read the words in those books. They are treasures. They are full of the words of life. If you heard, if you heard Sayyidina's letter that was written, let me see if I have it on my email. Did you guys all read the letter that was written to the Pope or read by one of the bishops during his funeral? Um, if you didn't, I'll read it in English. Should have it. He says, this is how he says goodbye at his funeral. I am your father and teacher. All of you, my children, listen to my commandments. I ask you, my beloved children, preserve and look after the faith of the Holy Trinity. I ask you, my beloved children, love one another with a true love. I ask you, my beloved children, do good with all humanity. I ask you, my beloved children, do not let the world deceive you. I ask you, my beloved children, do not fall short in the service of the Lord. I pray for you, my beloved children, pray without ceasing fervently. I pray for you, my beloved children, preserve your tongues from causing any division. I pray for you, my beloved children, preserve the holy baptism that was granted to you. I pray for you, my beloved children, preserve your body pure for the Lord. I pray for you, my beloved children, do not ever let your lamp weaken without light. I pray for you, my beloved children, preserve the commandments that God gave to you. I pray for you, my beloved children, that the fear of God be within you. God has witnessed, my beloved children, that I did not keep any of God's words away from you, that I never, ever slept my children and be blamed by any one of you, that if you preserve and keep what I have said to you, you will crush the head of the serpent. If you preserve and keep what I have said to you, you will eat of the goodness of the earth. If you preserve and keep what I have said to you, the shining cherubim will guard you. If you preserve and keep what I have said to you, you will never lack of the heavenly gifts. I ask of you, my beloved children, to ask of Christ for my soul, that it may have comfort before him, and do not count my shortfalls unknowingly and unwillingly to the clergy, bishops, and priests. I ask for your love, and I plead to your reverence to absolve me each and every one of you. And now I am far from you and left you, and I cannot see your faces. And now I ask of you all that you exhaust yourselves in prayers for me, remembrance in the holy liturgies, that my master may accept me to him and forgive me. And I ask Christ, the great shepherds of shepherds, that he may elect for you a righteous shepherd according to his will and heart, that he may shepherd you and your matters and watch for the salvation of your souls. Let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints, Lord. We know how proud you are of His holiness. And we pray, Lord, that you would give rest to His soul, and you would give comfort to His soul, and you would reward Him abundantly, Lord, for the way that he served us, Lord, not as a patriarch, but each and every member of the church as a father. We thank you, Lord, for giving us an angel to live among us. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us a true icon of the Lord Christ in our patriarch, that we may walk after his manner of life and that we may keep him as our example. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would accept his prayers before the throne of grace on our behalf. You would have mercy on your people and have mercy on your church. 
And give peace, Lord, to your one only holy Catholic Apostolic Church. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would give strength to each and every one of us, Lord, and that we can say that we have your fear before us all the day, Lord, that we can see you all the day and that we can acknowledge your presence. Give us the faith that you gave to this great man that we desire, Lord, to, to live even just a portion or to have a portion of the grace that you gave him. Grant that we may love you, Lord, like he loved you. Grant that at all times, Lord, we would feel that you would send us, Lord, and that you would send him to visit us through his wisdom to visit each and every one of his children, whether through his words or his books or his teaching or even himself. We pray, our dear Heavenly Father, that in this time where the church is, is, is going through a difficult time, that you, Lord, would be our high priest, Lord, leading us, Lord, to your kingdom. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would repose his soul in the bosom of our holy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I pray, Lord, that you would send us another angel to be in our midst, as you sent him to be in our midst. I pray, our dear Heavenly Father, that if he has made any mistake, Lord, that if he has made any, if he has any weakness, Lord, as he stands before your throne, Lord, that you would look past his weakness, Lord, and reward him for his faithfulness. We pray this all in your holy and precious name, through the intercessions of the Holy Virgin Mary, the prayers of St. Mark, and the prayers of our beloved Father, His Holiness, Pope Shenouda III, and the prayers of Abunim Shohikama, make us worthy to pray thankfully with one voice, our Father who art in heaven. And now the love of God the Father, grace of His only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, the gift and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Um, today is a, is a good opportunity to have your individual meetings. If anyone, um, I think some of the priests are in their offices if you need them.